Hello, I'm Kelly Copeland. Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. All this week, my dad, Kenneth Copeland, has laid a strong foundation for healing in God's Word. Well, today we have a special broadcast from my mother, Gloria Copeland, on the healing of your soul. When life takes an unexpected turn, learn how to take God's promises by faith and reinforce the victory Jesus has already won. Call somebody and tell them to watch. Incline your ear unto my sayings. Why do we do that? Because there's life there. That's where wisdom is. That's where God is. That's how He gets into us and gets into our lives. It opens the door for us to open the door for Him. Incline your ear to my sayings, your ear. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Them what? Them, them words. Keep the Word of God in the midst of your heart by going in your ear, in your eye. You don't get this just by wishing for it. You don't get it just because your preacher, your pastor's got it. You get it because you actually use your own eyes and ears in this endeavor. The words of God, keep them, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. You don't forget the words of God. You know, you can't remember all the words of God. You have to consume it daily. You know, I, can, I get excited on the inside about the Word. I mean, it's like something happens down there. I can almost feel it physically. I get stirred up. You're leaving here stirred up with the Word of faith. Now keep yourself stirred up that way, just the same way, by keeping the Word of God going in your eyes and in your ears. The Word, they are life. The words of God are life unto them that find them and health to all their flesh. Now that means anything today that's wrong in your flesh, the Word of God is life to you. The Spirit of God is present to heal you today. Your faith rises up within you to receive. God is a good God. He wants you well. He's always wanted His people well. Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with Him. Healing who? Healing all. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. He is the same. He still wants to heal every person in this place, every person watching on the Internet, everyone. This ought to settle it right here. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. There He is talking good about God again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Say it with me. Who forgiveth all thy diseases who healeth all thy diseases, who forgives all thy iniquities. I said it wrong. Who heals all thy diseases. How many? All. Would that be every disease in this place today? Yes. Who redeems your life from destruction. That's long life. And even in this long life, He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfies your mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Surely, Isaiah 53, 4 says in the Amplified, surely, this is sure, he has borne our griefs, which means sickness, weakness, and distresses and carried our sorrows and pains. If you're here today and you've been stricken with grief, you've lost a loved one or whatever is grieving you, maybe you lost something in the natural realm. Grief and death go together. Death comes and then grief comes to get a place in your life and in your family. Grief is an enemy. It steals, it kills, it destroys your life. It's a deadly emotion. You know, somebody will lose somebody in their family and then they'll get in grief and get sad and sorrowful and down and depressed where there's no life coming out of you. 
When, when you're depressed, there's no life force coming out of you. When the Word of God is coming out of you in life, you're not depressed. And what happens? Well, the loved one, maybe it's a husband or a wife, the one that's left then lets grief come in and grief moves in and the next thing you know, that person's sick. Dr. Colbert, are you here today? Is that true? Do you find that in your practice? That death will come in a family, then grief will move in and then those people will get sick and die too young a lot of times. It's just the way it is. It's a, it's a spirit. Now when, we, when you have that in your family and we've had some in our family, not, not in our children, but in our family. My brother, my niece, were both killed in car accidents, young, at a young age. And uh, we, we, we do this in our family. We, we know, I mean, you know, you, you're going to be sad, all right. It's going to be sad for you. But yet, you get over on the glory side of it. Both of those in our family, we knew went into the presence of the Lord immediately. So really, I mean, when you're, when you're, you're going to miss them, it's sad for you, but when you get right down to it, what's to grieve there? I mean, there's nothing like being in the presence of the Lord. There's nothing like being in heaven. There's nothing like it. The best earth could do would be very, very dark compared to living in heaven. And so you get over on the glory side of the thing. It's too, you know, if, if, if you haven't resurrected them and you've, you've put their body in the ground and their spirit's in heaven, what can you do more? Well, they would have you go on and live your life. Uh, it, would, it would be a grief to them if they knew that because they were in heaven now and in the glory and where it's great and wonderful, the devil was lying to you and keeping you in grief so that you couldn't fulfill the number of your days and do it in health and blessing. They would be sad to know that. Brother Hagin said that. He, and he had more experience on the other side than anybody I know. But he said that people uh, up there, they know what happens down here in the spirit. But they don't know natural things. Like they don't know if you've got a new car or whatever like that. But grief is a spiritual thing. And so if we really believe what we believe, we ought to, just, we ought to be able to take that, refuse to allow grief to come upon us, do what needs to be done, and walk on in life. Grief is an enemy. It's an enemy. And the reality of what's happening to them will be so much greater if you won't let grief settle in at your house. I mean, it's tough. I know it's tough. I mean, you know, you have certain pictures like, like uh, uh, there was a, two, two, both of them were car wrecks, and you have certain pictures of, that come into your mind, certain things, and you... You remember the time that you heard this and that, that you got the news and all that. But when that tries to get in you, come on you, you just say, no, no, I'm not having grief. I'm not having grief. My brother's in heaven. My niece is in heaven. Your loved one's in heaven. Now you go on and finish your course in Jesus' name. Finish your life. Don't let that stop you. Don't let it stop you. Don't let grief come to your house and live. It's a devil. And he looks for a place to live and grief and death travel together. So you, it's something for you to resist in Jesus' name. Jesus bore our griefs. Now, do you believe that? Yes. Well, then you have, to, you have to receive it. All right, here I am. I, I was reading the wrong one there. He, he was, where was that about grief? <coughs> Surely he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, weaknesses, distresses, and carried our sorrows. We, don't, we are not to carry our griefs. We are not to carry our sorrows. You have it. You deal with it. You go on with your life. 
And you know, you say, well, I don't know if my loved one was born again. Well, that's right, you don't know. So many people get born again. They wouldn't give God the time of day until life, they face life and death. You don't know. What do you have to do in a situation like that? You have to trust God. You can't just dream up your own thing. You have to trust God. Surely He has borne our griefs, sickness, weakness, and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains. Yet we considered Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He, as, uh, he was wounded, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. The chastisement needful to obtain our shalom, our peace, which means everything, health, prosperity, salvation, deliverance, and well-being was upon him. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. Surely he has borne our griefs. Surely he has borne our sickness and our weakness and distress and sorrows. And surely we don't have to bear them now. He did it for us. Every sickness, every disease, every weakness, every grief here in this place, that includes mental problems, depression, all kinds of situations. It includes addictions. It includes sin, immorality, anything, any kind of a lifestyle that is crosswise with God and you want to out of it, this is your day to go. This is your day to go free in Jesus' name. This is your day to be healed in the name of Jesus. This is your day to get up and walk and do what you couldn't do before. Jesus is alive and well, and He's here. And He loves you. Glory to God. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life when we pray, this is your day to get born again. Hallelujah. That's the first and the greatest step. So we're going to pray the prayer now, and uh, we're going to receive healing. Now, when, when we pray, the moment we pray, you take it, you seize it, you lay hold of it. That's what it means to receive, amen? You take it. You begin to do. Now, we're, it's just the family here. It would just tickle us all over if you just jumped up and ran around the building. We wouldn't care a bit. If you couldn't dance, dance. If you couldn't jump, jump. If you couldn't do your arms, do your arms. Start doing what you couldn't do before. The presence of the Lord is here to heal and to deliver. Now, if you're ready to pray in faith, you stand up and we're going to pray. If you can't stand up on the outside, stand up on the inside. In Jesus' name. I want you to uh, lift up your hand to the Lord. Shut your eyes. And pray this with all your heart and your soul. And then at the end of the prayer, I want you to take your healing, receive your healing, put it in your mouth, let it be in your heart. From here on, this is the day you take it. Say this, the gospel that I've heard, gospel heard is the power of God, power of God unto my salvation. I confess Jesus Christ as Lord over my life. As Lord over my spirit, soul, and body. Amen. I receive the power of God to make me sound, whole, delivered, saved, healed. Now, I act on the Word of God. And I receive the power of God. Sickness, disease, and pain. I resist you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not the will of God. Grief, I resist you in the name of Jesus. I enforce the word of God on you. I'll not tolerate you in my life. you back. My days of sickness and disease are over. 
My days of grief and sadness are over. My days of depression are over. I am the saved. I am the healed. The power of sickness has been broken over my life. Jesus himself bore my sickness, weakness, pain, and I'm free. Sickness shall no longer lord it over me. Sin shall no longer lord it over me. Fear shall no longer lord it over me. I've been redeemed from the curse. Healing and deliverance. I proclaim my freedom. Today, the gospel is the power of God unto me. To salvation. I receive the word of God. I act on the word of God. And I am made free in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay, 911, what is your emergency? Somebody was traveling the wrong way, and two people just had a head on collision. They're not responding. I like they're not conscious? They're not. In the van, they're not. Do they look like they're dead? Possibly, yes. No. On the morning of July 31st, 2011, um, my son was in a wreck on his way home from work and he was hit head on by a drunk driver. I went to the emergency room and they began to tell me the long list of injuries. I would go in when I would go to see Kevin and pretty much just tell him, you know, listen to your mama, <laughs> you're not done, you have a purpose. You got to get up out of that bed, tell Jesus you can't stay. Um, and it was just kind of pretty adamant with him. She did not let up. And all the um, training, all the, um, the things that we watched from Brother Copeland, all the uh, faith was, I mean, she grabbed a hold of it. She wasn't letting go. And she wouldn't let anyone talk any negative. She wouldn't let, what are you going to say? when you go in. Uh, she was very protective. But on August the 1st, 2011, at 8.57 in the morning, we went up to hear good news because we were trusting that God would raise him from the dead. Um, instead, we heard that he was brain dead. And I leaned down and I said, Kev, Mom's not ready for you to go. And I heard his voice so audibly, I thought he woke up. He said, Mom, it's too painful. Those were the words that I heard. And I stood up expecting to see his eyes open. And when I realized that he hadn't woke up, I knew that I was hearing from heaven. And as I stood there looking at Kevin, and it just kind of dawned on me what I was asking Kevin to do. And I realized that he was in the face of Jesus, where he'd always lived his life to be. And I thought, how selfish of me to ask him to come back when he was right there. And um, I just looked at him and I said, Kev, Mom will be okay. And I let him go at that point. We went in, in this room off the ICU waiting room uh, to pray. And I started praying out loud. And I heard myself say, God, I forgive her and what she's done to our family. All we knew it was a female, didn't know anything else. God had already told me that we, we needed to forgive this person. And when he told me that, I was like, I am not telling <laughs> her that. I said, if you want her to know that, you're going to have to tell her yourself. I am not going there, God. I'm not doing it. I opened my eyes 
because I thought, did I just really say that out loud? Because I surprised myself that I said that. And when she said that in that prayer, I, I started crying. I started broke down because I thought, yes, thank you, Jesus. Eventually, because I kept speaking God's Word, even though I didn't feel like it, even though my, my head was you know, yelling other things at me, and I continued to work through that process, speaking the Word and speaking over myself, it eventually changed my feelings. I chose to not allow what this woman did to trap me in a jail cell when I had the key to let me go. And forgiveness is freedom. I was so ashamed and embarrassed of what I had done. Um, I really didn't know how to deal with it. She came onto the news and I remember seeing, it was like she was looking right at me. And she said, Letitia, if you're watching this, I forgive you. I knew that I didn't deserve it. Um, so it's kind of hard to accept. I didn't understand why she would forgive me, but um, it was, I guess, comforting knowing that she um, had said that to me. She was sentenced to eight years vehicular homicide by intoxication and six years supervised probation after that. 11 months later, I get a phone call. She's coming up for parole. And so when I hung up the phone, I was like, God, really? Is Kevin's life not more than 11 months? And he said, you said you trusted me, that when it was my timing and I knew she was ready to get out, that you would be okay with that. And I was like, I know, but 11 months. And he said, do you trust me? Yes. If you know she's ready to get out now, I'll be okay with it. I said, but I have no idea what to say to the pro board. And he said, sit down and write what you hear. When it was my turn, I just read what God had me to write. And I started it off with, um, I'm guilty of murder too. And the person that I killed, his father accepts me, loves me as one of his own kids, doesn't hold what I did over my head, doesn't beat me up with it. And so who am I to not extend that same forgiveness that I've been given? And that person that I killed was Jesus. Am I saying what she did was okay? Absolutely not. But we can go forward together and make an impact together. And then about two weeks later, she got the news that uh, she was granted parole. She was released um, in November of 2013. And uh, we started speaking together in January of 2014 and uh, haven't stopped since. We go to high schools, rehab centers, community events, uh, anywhere and everywhere that allow us to come and share our story of um, the dangers and consequences of drinking and driving. But the message that shines through is the story of forgiveness. Knowing that we can help someone with our story, that means everything to me. Like, that is a lot of how I can accept the forgiveness and try to move forward is knowing that we're doing good um, in the world, you know, that we're trying to help other people uh, not have to go through what we've been through. So it's wonderful being able to share. We hope you enjoyed today's teaching from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And remember, Jesus is Lord.